Welcome to episode one of the Above the Best podcast. Views expressed in this episode may not reflect the official policy or positions of USACE, the Army, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The discussion that follows was recorded live on September the 23rd, 2021 at Fort Rucker, Alabama, and is presented with minimal editing. And now, Resiliency in Combat, Lessons from the Battle of Mogadishu. I am Major Mike Jones, the USA Special Operations Element Chief and a Special Operations Veteran. It is an honor to serve the exceptional aviators, warriors, and families of the Army Aviation Center of Excellence on behalf of the Special Operations Center of Excellence. Today, I want to take the opportunity to discuss a topic that has touched us all as soldiers, leaders, and the members of the profession of arms. This topic is resiliency in combat and sharing those lessons learned so that we are prepared for tomorrow. Before I introduce our special guest today, let me first bring you back to the events of September and October of 1993. In December of 1992, the United States launched the humanitarian operation Restore Hope in order to prevent the displacement of the Somali people. The 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit would secure a third of the city of Mogadishu and later be reinforced by the 10th Mountain Division. By March 1993, the security situation had improved, but no effective government was restored in Mogadishu. To that end, UNISOM II was authorized to restore the democratic state. A peace resolution was reached, but it was quickly evident that the Mohammed Adid faction would not comply with the National Reconciliation of Somalia. In June of 1993, Adid began his rebellion with an attack of coalition forces inspecting Radio Mogadishu. The attack resulted in 24 Pakistani forces killed, 57 wounded, one Italian casualty, and three American service members wounded, the first casualties of the conflict. This resulted in the hunt for Mohammed Adid intensifying. In response, Task Force Ranger was deployed in August of 1993. As Task Force Ranger began planning and conducting operations in search for Mohammed Adid, the Somali National Army would secure a significant psychological victory with the downing of the 1st Black Hawk helicopter in support of the 101st Airborne Division on, sept- on 25th September 1993, a week prior to Operation Gothic Serpent. On 3 October, U.S. Special Operations Forces from Task Force Ranger will launch Operation Gothic Serpent into the Bakara Market to capture elements of Muhammad Adid's faction. The daytime raid that was only last an hour quickly escalated as the Somali militia, who were armed with machine guns and RPGs, massed forces, and would successfully down multiple Black Hawk helicopters. This event would become known as Black Hawk Down. As the Somali forces massed into the thousands, the elements of Task Force Rangers would find themselves quickly pinned down and surrounded while valiantly defending the crash sites. This became a 19-hour standoff that would last into the early morning of 4 October 1993. Repeated attacks were made through the night, but those attacks were successfully repelled uh, by AH-6 Little Birds and ground forces that would repeatedly go back into the city in order to defend their down elements of Task Force Ranger. Ultimately, this would prevent the U.S. positions from being overran until the last American forces could be extracted from the city in what would later be known as the Mogadishu Mile. In the most intense sustained combat since the Vietnam War, casualties ultimately included 19 American soldiers killed in action and 73 wounded, two of which would posthumously receive the Medal of Honor. Pakistani forces would suffer one death and two injuries, while Malaysian forces would suffer one death and seven wounded. Today it's our privilege to remember and honor those warriors and their families that were impacted by these events. Today we ask the questions, what is the importance of resiliency in the post-traumatic environment? How do we deal with the post-traumatic combat events during the moments and afterwards once the dust has settled? How do we honor our fallen teammates with dignity and respect as we grieve their loss? What does the healthy path forward look like? And then how can we as leaders and future leaders set the pace for the formation as we face difficult situations uh, of today and tomorrow's battlefields. Today, we will walk and talk about these topics, uh, and we're very excited uh, today to be joined by our honored guest, CW3, retired Mr. Perry Alleman, who served as an Army aviator and safety officer in various locations around the world. 
uh, who would later uh, retire after 25 successful years of service. He served as the 101st Airborne Division U-860 pilot, earning the Purple Heart from the events of 25 September 1993 in Mogadishu. Perry also holds a master's in pastoral counseling and continues to serve as the Fort Rucker military community. Additionally, we're joined by Sergeant First Class Retired Jeff Holst, who served in the Special Operations Community for 24 years uh, with assignments to the 75th Ranger Regiment and the 7th Special Forces Group Airborne. Jeff served as the Task Force Ranger Team Leader during Operation Gothic Serpent on the ground and is a Bronze Star in Joint Service Accommodation with Valuable Recipient. Additionally, we have from the Lister Army Medical Clinic join us today. We have Major Adam Keller the uh, from the Department of Behavioral Health. Adam currently serves as a psychiatric nurse practitioner, the clinical consultant for substance abuse use, as well as the medical review officer here at Fort Rucker. Today, it's our pleasure to have you with all have you all with us today, and we look forward to our discussion. So, right off the bat, gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. I uh, want to lead out uh, with a question for uh, for you, Perry and, and Jeff. You know, take a moment and uh, first over to you, Perry. Can you share with us what you remember? Uh, from the events in Somalia uh, that led up to uh, your event in September, and then pass it over to you, Jeff. What do you remember from uh, your time there on the ground on 3 and 4 October? Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. This um, These anniversaries are kind of tough, and uh, as we kind of try to think back to what has happened in the past and what got us to where we were, um, you know, for us, often what gets us into the fight are really good intentions. We're, we're not a nation that conquers just to take. We're usually going into a place to to help a people that are being abused or beaten down. So our motives are always good. And I remember distinctly watching the starvation on TV and hearing about all the killing that was going on and the raping and the watching kids starving to death and knowing that we had already had some guys from our 5th Battalion, 101st, there for almost six months. But when the thing with the um, Italian Army went down and they attacked them and, and, filleted, and they actually filleted their bodies, which was not necessarily in the press, but um, we were fired up to go over there and do something about it. So when we got over there, I was really struck with the, the just the abject poverty that was in the nation and around us. They weren't even wires on the telephone poles. And so getting there uh, to join up with the, from the, with the 10th Mountain Command that was already there to relieve them on the scene, um, it was quite a um, shock to see the condition of the country, the condition of the people. Um, so we began flying missions pretty much immediately. And uh, best I could tell, the mission of feeding people had been accomplished, but now we were trying to stop a deed from what he was doing and uh, help support the Pakistani and the rest of the UN forces that were there. On the night of September 25th, myself, and I actually would say that like Dale Schrader is, is my, my hero in this story. I wish he could be here um, because he was the one that, in my opinion, like the, the, the real <laughs> needed actions on the ground once we got on the ground. But we're flying this mission called Eyes Over Mogadishu, watching the five different bases that we had there to make sure that nobody was mounting an attack against it. And if they were, that we would begin the repelling of that attack. Uh, during that night, we came in to get refueled. And as we were getting refueled, um, they fired three mortars at us um, from, of course, outside the base. And the mortars were getting progressively closer. By the time the third mortar hit, uh, my crew chief, Sergeant Williams, had unhooked the aircraft and he and Specialist Anderson jumped back in and Sergeant Richardson from 10th Mountain was also in the aircraft. Um, we flew away from the pad, checked out the aircraft, and then um, got the coordinates of the location of the mortar attack, and we launched to go and see if we could locate the mortar site. Once we got there, nothing to be seen, um, and we continued to patrol for about the next 30 minutes. As we were getting ready to call it a night and come in, uh, we headed back towards the airfield. Um, someone came out on a roof um, with an RPG. Um, we were flying at about 
30 feet off the rooftops, about 100 plus knots. But the sky was overcast and about 70% moon illumination, which means we're being backlitten by the white sky. So they could see uh, the aircraft. And they took a sh the guy took a shot, and this RPG hit the aircraft in the belly in the back of the aircraft in the cabin area. And a fireball exploded in the aircraft. RPGs don't really have a fireball, but the, sh the, the copper jet explodes through the aircraft. I don't know how the rotors stayed on, um, but that blast kind of knocked me out of it. And we started a right descending turn. Dale flipped up his goggles because we were on fire. And uh, pretty sure Sergeant Williams and Anderson were firing their machine guns, and uh, or at least Williams was. I mean, uh, Anderson was. Um, as we descended, we uh, crashed in the, at an intersection in the street and slid into a building on the right. Um, at that point, um, I had no idea all that had happened initially. But the Black Hawk seed is designed to stroke down to absorb the energy of a crash, and it did that. But when it strokes down, the cyclic that you're flying with stays right where it is, which is probably in the in the aft position because you're decelling. And uh, my face came down and struck the cyclic, and my night vision goggles went into the panel. So I basically broke the orbit of my right eye, um, crushed my right sinus, and, and broke my jaw. Um, so I was basically at that point punch drunk and uh, I was up against the building Dell tried to get out and he uh, forgot he had his seatbelt on pulled his seatbelt he fell out and broke his left arm at the wrist and uh, he came around the front like we brief like we normally brief and uh, I went through the cockpit window which had been broken out and I met him on the no at the nose and I said to him Dale I'm burned really bad I didn't know it but I was actually burned 33% of my body, my head, my neck, my shoulders, my thighs, um, back of my right calf. And he was burned 18%. And he tied me down like we brief, went back to the aircraft to try to help the other guys in the back, but he couldn't see anybody and the fire was already in our seats. And the aircraft was beginning, the ammunition was starting to cook off in the back. So he threw his night vision goggles into the fire came back and got me and took me into an alleyway. And uh, it was in that alleyway that uh, we took up positions. I tried to load my nine mil, couldn't get it loaded. Um, and he was on by some steps and around um, 30 minutes, he tried to get his signal light, his uh, radio to work, it wouldn't work. He tried to get my radio, it wasn't even in my vest, it had broken out of my vest. And uh, so at that point he tried to get his signal light to work and once he got that on, he heard people coming towards us. So he turned it off and stuck it in the dirt to cover it up. And they walked, two Somalis walked right in front of us. They went around the corner of the, the, the alleyway and watched the aircraft burn. And then they left. Um, so at that point, you know, I know we don't want to spend a whole time talking about this, but at that point, um, our unit had already found out that we had crashed. We made a mayday call. Another aircraft went over, took a look. Um, they were trying to put together what could they do to come and try to find us if we survived or not. And that's a whole nother kind of long story there, um, how that went down. But um, a few, a few, maybe 30 minutes later, the Somalis came back and this time they saw Dale. They saw his leg in the shadows and they threw some hand grenades at us and Dale responded with, with nine mil fire, emptied his first nine round magazine. By the way, we only had four. <laughs> Uh, back then, we didn't um, think through what do you do in this situation. You know, we're, here we are trying to do peacekeeping slash feed people, but now we're on the offensive. Um, we definitely weren't prepared for what we were facing. And uh, he, um, the Somalis at that point knew we were there, but they didn't know if that we were the rescue guys or we were the guys from the aircraft. They thought we had automatic weapons. So they were a little afraid and they stayed back. And... Um, over the next couple of hours, they kept trying to get to us while the, the, our unit was trying to do some kind of a effort to re rescue us. And um, eventually an armed personnel carrier did come close by. And, uh, and one of the Somalis before that ran down the alleyway where we were, and he fired his 
AK, an automatic fire, Dale did shoot him and he ran out of bullets. And uh, the guy did drop. And at, right after that happened, Dale come, came over to me and he prayed with me. We we're both Christians. And he, he said, uh, Lord, forgive me for not sharing Christ with more people, but we're ready to come home. And right about the time he got done praying, a, a UAE soldier comes out in the alleyway and says, American boys. And Dale went to him and he points to this armored personnel carry down the street. Dale gets, comes back to me, gets me up, and we beat feet down the alleyway and get into the APC, and they, they take us out of there. So that's kind of the quick what happened, and that's the things that, um, that we have to kind of deal with is how all that went down. And we'll talk some more about the losses of men because we lost three guys that night. Yeah, Absolutely. So, you know, faith plays a huge <coughs> part in resiliency. We're, we're going to come back to that point. Uh, you know, you mentioned you mentioned a point where we had successfully restored uh, some type of governance as, as far as being able to provide security and, and getting food flowing back uh, to the Somali people. But one of the things that we had not been successful with at that time was, uh, you know, successfully uh, mitigating the the threat caused by Muhammad Adid Farrar, and that's what one of the things that led to. Uh, ultimately the events of Operation Gothic Serpent, you know, that was another uh, mission to try to take out a deed. Um, so I'd like to pitch that same question over to you to Jeff. Can you can you walk us through uh, your events of uh, 3 and 4 October during Gothic Serpent? So, you know, here we are. We're Rangers, uh, Special Forces, you know, Delta uh, Task Force Ranger. Um, when we were in Fort Bragg, we were sitting there um, at the compound there with uh, C Squadron. And I remember just, you know, watching on TV, it's like, wow, you know, we're going, we're going to combat. That's what everybody looks forward to, you know, as a ranger, you know, right. You know, we're going to combat, you know, who, 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 um, we're sitting there and we're watching on TV while we're prepping our, um, equipment. We had new equipment, command weapons, uh, armor, everything like that. We're all getting all fired up. We're going to combat. Um, we were getting Intel briefings, stuff like that from the guys. And, you know, you look around and you realize that, you know, we're getting ready, you know, to, to go into a country that we don't really know a lot about, um, just about that, you know, that they had um, famine in their country and people are starving and, um, you know, they just, you know, they, they just want to um, live their own lives just like we Americans do. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I would take to it is when I watched the TV, when I heard Task Force Ranger, a um, couple hundred people, a Task Force Ranger going over there to help Somali as well, um, you know, right away we kind of we kind of stamped the letter and sent it prior before we got there. Task Force Ranger, if you look up Rangers, Special Forces, Delta, whatever it is, SEALs, um, right away, they're, they're combat warriors. I mean, we're going in there to do a job. We're not going in there to shake hands, and and uh, we're not doing civil affairs like that. Um, once we got there, um, you know, we get off the aircraft, and we're getting our, our prepping everything like that together in our different chalks. Like I said, I was on chalk three. Um you know, we get everybody together and get your mindset and look at everything. And that night, um, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that night, as soon as we arrived that night, um, we got mortared over at the hangar. Uh, we got mortared. Yep. Yep. We got mortared at the hangar and we actually launched. I remember getting on the vehicle, you know, we got our helicopters, we got out there and we flew around. And I remember that night we were coming in because uh, we were looking for him. I remember one of the guys. One of the guys, uh, John Collette, and when he when he fast roped down, as one of the first guys fast roping down, Super Six Six Gunslinger, we fast roped down on the objective to get him because uh, they're mortaring us. You know, we're Rangers are going in to take care of you. Uh, we're knocking on your door, and I remember, um, you know, the, one of the weapon systems getting caught up in the strap up there. And I remember it could be a bad day or whatever, but uh, um, it wasn't really all that intense that time right there. But we know it was it was amping up to it. I remember a couple of times talking to um, Cleveland. Cleveland Task Force Ranger, uh, he was one of the guys who's sitting in the, in the uh, air conditioned chow hall about, you know, the it's quiet before the storm. But uh, you know, we we prepped, we got everything together like we should as soldiers and and, and the units and stuff like that, and, and uh, the intel and everything that we had from, that we gathered. And um, but uh, um, we had we had a few missions before th uh, three and four October. We had different infrastructures. Uh, take down a deed if we could find a deed take down his infrastructures lieutenants captains whatever you know take take them down and then you know start knocking them down one by one like at the chess game um and just you know things led up to there and uh, we'd go out there during the daytime and we would we would practice shooting um 
Um, we practiced training and stuff like that. We kept training constantly um, to prepare for the uh, for the missions. Okay, can you talk us through uh, your experience during Gothic Serpent? Yeah, so uh, we're we're uh, we're in there, uh, we're in the hangar, and uh, we're sitting in the hangar and stuff like that. And, and they had the jock, and uh, and down down the airfield was um, uh, Mr. Elman. You were down the airfield. Yep, yep, you're down the airfield there, and uh, we uh, we. We heard a few things that happened and stuff like that, the intelligence and everything like that and what was going on. And, you know, because we're all there together. We're, you know, we're um, we're soldiers all together. You know, there's one fight, one group. Um, we got we got prepared and told us to get it on. It's about like, I'd say it's 1,500 hours like that. We were, some of us were sitting there playing uh, Stratego or not, not Stratego, we we're playing Risk. Uh, me and Smitty, a couple other guys and the unit guys, the Delta guys were playing uh, some games. And I remember about 1,500, I said, get it on. So they come out of the jock and say, get it on. And then uh, it was daylight and we had all our stuff prepped. We go over there by the side of the hangar and we grab everything from chalk three. We grab everything, we grenades, whatever ammunition. We load it up and get our gear on. And then we would link up at the hangar there. We'd walk towards the bird. Uh, the guys would be on their uh, on their birds, give us a thumbs up and they would fly. And then we'd fly over the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, Sergeant Watson would give us on. They were going east to west. You know how many bad guys are in there, stuff like that. And we'd go over. We'd do a gun run out in the Indian Ocean, and then we rolled in. And um, when we rolled in, right away, as soon as we rolled in, we knew it was getting hot because uh, we started receiving a lot of fire. Um, and like I said, I was, you know, I was on the birds, stuff like that. I was right there with a the rope, and stuff like that. I was waiting to, to go down. So um, with the rotor wash and everything going on, no fear, Ned. The mini gun was going. I mean. You know, I'm sitting right next to the minigun and just it's just spinning rounds. And all of a sudden they come in there and we come in and we flare and then the ropes go down. And I don't even remember looking at the ground. I just went. I just went. I had so much gear on me and stuff like that. I was, you know, just I had everything on me. Um, extra magazines, my butt pack, uh, frags, um, um, explosives, everything, just everything on me. Um, Remington 870, uh, just loaded down to the gills. You know, loaded to the max and knee pads. I remember hitting the ground. My knee pads were gone, but I remember hitting the ground. As soon as we hit the ground, you could hear the whiz and the the, uh, the crack of the rounds. And we get up on the side in the rotor wash, and then we would get against the building. We'd start moving in, and then we'd start gathering up and find out what's going on to uh, take down our objective. All right. So, uh, a question to both you gentlemen. Uh, you know. Perry, you mentioned that you know faith played a, a big part in keeping you focused. But in, in addition to the faith aspect, though, what were the driving things that kept you guys focused uh, during Perry with you during the the, the shoot down of your aircraft, and then Jeff with you during the the one hour standoff that would turn into an eighteen hour overnight ordeal? Yeah. So. I would love to say that I was very focused and I was in control and I did all kinds of cool things, but that would be just making up stuff. Um, I, I know that the training that we got was key. Like it, it, it has to almost become muscle memory of what you're doing. Um, and so like one of the lessons learned for me, I had a, I had a AR in the aircraft next to me in the door. And I had six clips of 30 round magazines, trace a second from the top, third from the bottom. I was prepared to use that rifle, but I never trained in getting out of the aircraft and grabbing the rifle. So I left it. I don't know where it went. Um, so when I talk to guys now about lessons learned, I'm like, if you're taking additional equipment where you place it, every time you move out of that aircraft, you gotta put your hand on it. You gotta, it has to be a part of your non-thinking actions. Um, and so essentially I was so broken at that point that I was essentially just laying on my back, trying not to pass out. Um, so Dale really had to like cover me and take care of me and protect me. And he could have probably left and he probably could have made it back. He was not injured to the place where he couldn't do that, but he chose to stay. Um, so, um, at this point, we're kind of in, I'm kind of in a just survival mode, trying to not pass out, getting pretty thirsty. Um, so I would say for him, if I could speak for him, um, is that our training is what kicks in now. 
right? You got to get some cover. You got to get some concealment. You got to get some comms. You know, you, you have to be able to tell people that, hey, I'm alive so that they know. Um, and so he was doing the best that he could just to protect. And he did a great job. Um, it, a lot of folks don't know it, but he later received the Silver Star. And actually, I just heard that they upgraded many of the medals from the Task Force Ranger, which is appropriate um, recently. Yeah, so he he fell back on his training and he fell back on his keeping faith with his family, his friends and his nation. So the whole idea of that, I'm not going to leave a fallen comrade stuck in his mind. He's not going to leave me there. And he stayed with me and he and he fought to defend both of us. And so I think the training that we received all along, including how to not let the aircraft just fly into the building when you get hit, you know, the, the emergency procedures that we learned, how we perform those procedures, how we get out of the aircraft, where do we meet? It becomes a second nature. So training is probably the most important thing just to help you to stay focused um, and keeping faith with each other. Yeah. And Jeff, same same question over you. What was what was the driving factor in keeping a mission focused? And, you know, especially for uh, for yourself and your teammates, and then you know, ultimately getting linked back up into uh, the larger formation uh, and the survivability through the night. I would say just like Perry, uh, I'll just add to what Perry said. Caveat: training, 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 physically, mentally, uh, preparing. Um, that's why we have spe- uh, selections and. And what guys volunteer to do this type of work, um, it do, not just many people just go out there, um, you know, and I take my hat off to Mr. Perry, you know, aviators and, and the ground troops on the ground, us guys in there, we're the ones that's doing all the dirty work. Um, but uh, training, um, the mindset, um, just knowing that, you know, your guys, you know, getting together and uh, working together and being a team leader, know we can go in here and do this. Um, and some of us might not come out alive. Um, that's always going through your head. It's not easy. Um, and you're in a different country. And then, and then we rope in, we rope in right there. We fast rope in, um, you know, take away and, and uh, different things we could do better is why did we rope in? Yeah, we roped in the middle of the city and we roped in in the, in the uh, intersections, but we stayed on the outside of the buildings. We learned from our lessons learned that we should have taken the buildings right away. We should have cleared the buildings right away. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to go in there and shoot everybody, but we still have to clear them. We can, we can detain them. We can gag them, whatever, but get off the streets. The biggest thing was get off the streets. We got a lot of, because they know we're out there. Um, they knew our capabilities. Um, they knew our TTPs. They were well rehearsed in who's coming over here um, in that country over there. Yeah. I would also, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, so Colin Powell once said that um, mom and apple pie, the flag gets us to the fight. But that's not what gets a guy to, to die for his brother. It's the guy on his left and his right. Amen. Yes. That, that's, what, yep. that's what Dale was thinking about was Perry's got a wife and three kids. And so he wasn't thinking about the flag. He wasn't thinking about the mission he was thinking about his brother. And I think for us in the army, that's probably the main, you know, the main thing. Once we we get there because of the flag, because we love our country, Mm -hmm. but what keeps us there, what what makes us do the most craziest thing for, and and put your life at risk is the guy on your left and the guy on your right. Absolutely. Brothers, brothers in arms, like he said, just, you know, it means a lot, the guys on left and right, because while we were there and Mr. Perry was there, Everything still was going around. Everybody was still going to sports games, sports events. While we're over 18, 20 some hours away fighting for our lives all night long, things are still going on. Things, you know, things are still revolving while guys are dying, getting shot at. Um, nobody knows what it's like. It's, it's not an, it's not a, it's not a picture scene. It's not a movie. It's a real life action. Um, and that's what happens. Um, you know, nobody, you know, everybody like, but yeah, I don't want to go to combat. I want to go to combat. So like that, it's different. Once you're on the ground, it's totally different. When you see your buddies, you know, disappearing left and right. He's he, he's here that now, and he's gone tomorrow. Or you're looking at your buddy, he's bleeding out. It's uh, it's it's pretty intense. So Jeff, what would what would you say that you would tell your 
your teammates on the ground that evening to, in order to keep them focused, knowing that this is going to be a sustained fight through the night? The biggest thing is we got from our platoon sergeant too, Sergeant Watson. Um, he, it's like, you know, we're Rangers. We all knew this, we're Rangers. Uh, and as Rangers so like that, you know, that's, that's what our job is, uh, is, you know, to go in there and, and do the dirty things. Um, so good people can sleep at night. Um, ammunition, ammunition. Um, we couldn't say a lot about water because, you know, when we rolled in there, you know, we, we, we thought just like Mr. Perry knows, we thought we were just going to go in there. Hey, you know, we're, we're task force ranger. We'd go in there and mop them up and we're going to come back and have a barbecue and, and carry on that had happened. Um, we didn't have a lot of water. Um, ammunition is the biggest key. I mean, guys, you know, going through their ACE reports, ammunition, casualty, um, you know, equipment, but the biggest thing is just having your, having that mindset and, uh, you know, no one, but, uh, when you're up, we put guys out on the, uh, on the perimeters a little bit, and then you're looking at your ammunition, you had your injured and dead in the uh, buildings. And then we're looking at moving casualty collection points. Um, we are all going to like do one mass casualty collection point, And then, uh, we realized that we couldn't do that. And then we had a reactionary force was supposed to come in and get us right away, but that didn't come happen for a while. But uh, just trying to try to keep that mental mindset. And then uh, if we could do it more, but you couldn't do it, is pick up and move to your guys one by one and look at them in the face and kind of give them a, a chance to pray. One o'clock in the morning, full moon. How much ammunition you have left? I have this much left, Sergeant. I mean, how, how much do you have? You know, just moving around your guys, it's, it's, it's key. Communication is key to anything you do accountability so gentlemen you hit you guys hit you know several key points there that are that are crucial uh muscle memory in your training uh face-to-face -face communication with with your people uh trusting your brother on your left and right to to make sure that you can survive through the fog of combat and these things are absolutely uh, essential in these events um jeff i want to come back to you can you take us through uh, through the events on on the night of the third and the fourth of October, the night of three October in the morning, of four October uh, on, in Gothic Serpent, um, what was your experience there on the ground? From you know, you you talked to us on the initial part of the mission, but how was your experience through the night, and then your process of of dealing with it uh, after the after the fact? Well, once we roped, once we, uh, once we um, roped in and we were um, engaged heavily right away, <clears throat> uh, we we were maneuvering around and uh, we were trying to conserve our ammunition and and you know um, and we were like I said we were going up we were going through the alleys like that and getting to the objective and then we got stuck in one of the buildings there and we were fighting for our lives all night long um, ammunition um, guys coming in guys you know covered up with a uh, poncho so like that been shot and killed um and then uh you know the biggest thing was uh the biggest thing was is trying to trying to stay together as a team and focus because a lot of us were you know you're individually you're individual there was blood all over the place you were slipping and sliding um trying to focus i remember that night the thing that really to this day every time i hear a helicopter and i hear a helicopter fly over i know I know the the uh, it was going to be good because when they'd fly over the little birds would fly over, and they'd have the gun runs and we'd hear all the brass landing on top of the shanties at night and we're like wow you know this is this is good um this 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 is victory, but um once we maneuvered out of there um, in the morning after several hours and stuff like that I remember the guys come in there and I, they went in the back room and I don't remember where they were and we're maneuvered down the roads so like that maneuvering uh, from place to place getting shot at and. Um, it was still it was still an all all on firefight um it was it was hard to stay focused because you know you'd hear on the radio and stuff like that you know your team leader or squad leader or whatever who it is um that we're going to move one cash collection point and have several we're going to have just one cash collection point and if we did we'd had more we'd have more injuries and more more uh, more dead and wounded we'd have been ha having a lot more body bags um but i would say the biggest thing is is uh when they went back and they refueled and they fired up everything and then everybody got off the streets. But then when, when they were gone to go refuel and uh, hit the FARP um, and get more ammunition and fuel and stuff like that, come back, that's when they all came out again. The Somalis came out. Um, plus, they were uncaught that night. So they were, you know, they were ready to fight. 
Um, and we're in their country also. I mean, we're taking where taking where their um, you know, their area. Um, you know, they think that we're invading their space. But uh, when we got out of there, when we started maneuvering out of there, um, you know, with our dead and wounded, it took us several hours to get out of there. Um, coming down the streets and running through the streets and stuff like that. Um, and I remember getting in the vehicles and then getting to accountability. Accountability is a big thing. And I remember getting into the stadium there. We all jump by the stadium and we're hugging one another. And then we're doing accountability and find out who's dead, who's wounded and checking everything else. And, um, you know, we still weren't out of the fight yet. We were, we were at the stadium compound when the, uh, Packies came in there, um, to get us out of there. Um, and I'd say one thing it's, um, you know, again, um, Having a good understanding of, uh, you know, like I said, having a good spiritual background or just, you know, believing in one another. And also just uh, um, the hardest thing is, is, is uh, when you're a leader and stuff like that, you know, that your guys are looking up to you. And sometimes, you know, any one of us, you know, you go black or whatever and have someone grab you and get you back in, you know, get your shit together or whatever, get back into it. Um, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. But um, the biggest thing was is the takeaway was once we got back, you know, and you got all your buddies that you've been hanging around for a long time and trained with them for months and stuff like that or whatever, um, they're no longer there. Um, and realizing, you know, you're here today and gone tomorrow. Um, life has its values, but, um, that's our job. Um, that was our job. That's why we joined the military, you know, so we could defend. So no one would come to our country and, and try to uh, invade us. Yeah, absolutely. As leaders, we definitely have to, you know, take that tactile pause and engage with our formations and make sure that they know that we're nested in the fight with them, alongside them, and that we're focused on the mission to keep them focused on the task at hand, especially when we're dealing with these types of situations. When you leave a unit like the Rangers, they're a step above everybody else and stuff like that. That's uh, it just how it is. Um, and then uh, going to another unit, um, it was a little difficult for me at first because there was no war at the time. You know, it was not a war; it was a conflict. And then you go to another unit, and right away, some of the, some of the guys they start talking about this and that, and the movies come out, and, and right away, it's like, uh, um, you know, they think you're beating your chest. No, we're not beating our chest. It was hard. I was in tears when when they came to the market fair there in Fort Bragg and played the first Black Hawk Down, and all the actors were there. I was in I was I was in tears. You could drop a pin. All the operators from Fort Bragg there, um, the C Squadron guys or whoever was in the mess, even some of the actors up there. I remember um, um, different actors coming up there and, and uh, you know, and, and being invited to this. But uh, um, to this day, I've watched Black Hawk Down all the way through maybe one time. I know it's a lot different than what really actually happened over there, like an eighth of what really happened. But it's different. Um, you know, I think. The reality is, is we don't tell the truth. We don't tell the true meaning of war and what it means to be in war. And we don't, nobody understands. They just watch Hollywood and stuff like that. What goes on war is hell. You know, I mean, you're going to hell when, when you're in war. I mean, things, bad things happen. Um, and then you try to come home and put it together and mend it with your pieces. I mean, I have a good wife. She's really understanding, but, um, it's, it's hard sometimes, uh, things that, um, will trigger me and stuff like that. But then I find myself to release, uh, I have horses and cows and sometimes I take off and I'll go do my own thing. And, and when I was working overseas, I, a lot of young guys and even older guys that don't understand what it's like to be in a situation. They just think going here and working out and doing this and doing that, you know, they're all, they're all, they're, they're you know, they're badasses. excuse my French, but that's what they think they are. They don't understand that it could happen any day. Those gates could be blown, and then next thing you know, we're in a 360-degree firefight for our lives. I want to shift, shift topics a little bit. You know, we, your guys' b events both resulted in uh, casualty and loss. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity for to address how did you guys deal with the hardship, hardship mm. of losing a teammate, and then how did you deal with that loss at that time, and then how have you dealt with it over time? If you could give us a brief breakdown. Yeah, boy, um, I'm not going to lie and tell you that it was easy. Um, I didn't deal with it well at all. Um, you know, as the pilot in command or the, just the co-pilot in the aircraft, you got these really young guys, infantry door gunner, you got a young sergeant, 
that's your 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 crew chief and you feel like you're responsible for his life you're responsible to get him back home so when he dies and he doesn't it's it's pretty traumatic and and it and there's the guilt of why why not me why why not me and not him and so that that kind of weighs on you and then there's also the the what am i going to say to their family um so all of that um comes into play and it can really take it to dark places and the idea of making and getting revenge to settle the score um really comes into play strong for a while and you feel i was trying to figure out how i could get back over there to kill a deed if it was possible how could i make it happen <laughs> um and and i think it was a blessing that got he, he got killed mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. could then i couldn't do that so that, you know he since he died i couldn't go back but i was searching the internet it was very slow back then but i had these little things that were like pulling out news articles that had his name in it and i was reading all those articles trying to figure out where he was going to be when he was going to be there if he's going to ever leave the country and maybe go somewhere else that i could get to <laughs> um so that kind of a hate what I didn't know was that was actually them destroying me from the inside out after the fight. And so that's something we'll talk about in a minute, I think, um, is that the, the hatred that was there for what he did, and especially October 3rd, because I got to watch that from my hospital bed, and they came and took my TV away so I wouldn't see it, um, which really angered me. Um, and so I'm watching my brother's and get slaughtered and i'm watching the, the actions of the crowd on the ground and that's not helping <laughs> you know this hate you know what they did to us after the guys were down um was inhumane and cruel and and so um we would never do that to people that's just not our way we go in we'll kill people and we need to be able to, don't get, get me wrong what i'm saying today is like we need hard men who will go and kill the bad guys um, but we don't torture them after we get them. We don't kill them. After, we don't drag their bodies through the streets in celebration. Um, we don't do those kinds of things. And so that all seeing all that, knowing about all that, and getting some briefings on what actually happened, which we won't talk about here, um, elevates your your inner anger and your desire for revenge, and um, and that that can really like take you down a dark place. And in reality, it will it, it is something that will destroy you. And if I could talk to anyone that's out there that's been through some things, and it doesn't have to be combat, a lot of times this kind of reaction leads us to where we're having these problems with suicide and people mm -hmm. feeling like there's no hope. And because there's no hope, I'll just end it. And if you're listening and you feel like there's no hope, there is hope. And they're, we're gonna, there are places right now that will be do everything they can to help you and prevent you from taking your life. But uh, all kinds of bad things, whether, whether it's abuse of family, children, marriages breaking and divorce, all the way to suicide, can occur when we don't deal with the hurt and the pain that we feel from the lack of um, satisfactory outcome to the situation. So I think I didn't do a lot with it initially. Um, I don't remember where I was reading. It was one of the Old Testament books, First or Second Samuel, and I, it kind of dawned on me that if I don't forgive these guys, I won't be able to break the bond that ties me to the people that hurt me. And that that was like a, a magical moment when I realized that I didn't have I didn't do it. <laughs> I, re, I rejected that thought initially, but it, it dawned on me that if I don't find a way to forgive, it's going to kill me. And so that led me on a on a on a journey of trying to figure out how to forgive and this deal with the grief and walk. I know you mentioned in the little notes that we have a long road. It's good, it's a good way to think about it because your life is never gonna be the same again. But there is a new normal you can, that you can build and that you can have peace. So if I could encourage guys to figure out that piece of it, get, them, get the help that you need to find a way to forgive. And when you do that, it's gonna be little by little. My daughter, 
she was went to FSU and I went to one of her things when she was getting ready to graduate before she went to medical school. And she had a Somali friend <laughs> and she was absolutely petrified to even introduce me. And at that point I was able to like, I was, I was well on my way <laughs> and I knew I was making progress when I reached out and I shook his hand yep. and said, hello. Um, which is huge because <laughs> It, it, something happens to you where it burns this thing in your brain and you see a Somali, which is a particular look. And inside of you, this thing just heats up. Sure. And, and you got to find a way to get past that or it will, it will tear you to pieces. Yeah. How's your experience been, Jeff? Uh <laughs> It comes and goes, I would say, uh, you know, from from task force ranger and to special forces and being in Afghanistan and other places. Um, it's different. It, it's totally different. Um, you know, a lot of guys don't understand what we went through. We didn't have um, we didn't have all the uh, um, high speed aircraft and, and tanks. And, and we were just like, um, you know, task force ranger, just guys on the ground, you know, going in there to um to take these targets out and then and then go home and celebrate but it, it's pretty tough because uh um you know we had these packages to have like vehicles and uh and tanks and everything like that but you know the ones above us and the administration that was in charge at the time uh the clinton administration they did not um agree with uh you know having the tanks and stuff like that because they didn't want all the uh the bloody bloodiness and um it wasn't a war uh, a lot of people don't realize, like, um, you know, like when you go, when like I go into VA or Mr. Perry, when you go into VA, you guys are in Somalia. I said, okay, you know, um, but we were in something that nobody talks about Afghanistan, Iraq, the war. Everybody's been in the war, but it was a conflict. It right. was, it was a conflict that a lot of people don't even want to talk about to this day. They want to bury it. Um, and then when you come up about talking about they're going to honor, you know, task force ranger and all the guys that were there, you know, and upgrade their medals. Why didn't we do this a long time ago? It's not about the medals that you pin on your chest, that your buddies and your left and your right, that you left um, in that country that fought and died for their country back home and their families will never see them again to this day. Um, was it all worth it? Um, but like, like, uh, like we said, you know, uh, we do it because we're Americans and, we're a helping nation. We help everybody out there. Um, it's been like that. America is the, the uh, America is the lending hand. Um, it's a uh, it's difficult. Um, it's um, a lot of times um, I escape certain things. I will like do things by myself. Um, be away from people. Um, I used to drink a lot, but but that didn't work anymore. And then, uh, cause my father was, a my, my father was an alcoholic and I didn't, I didn't see any, uh, um, light at the end of the tunnel. So like that. So I was like, um, I stopped drinking and so like that because, you know, when you're, um, when you're delirious or drinking or drugs, I never did drugs or anything like that. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, there's other things to reach out to. Um, um, I'm a Christian myself. I don't follow, I don't follow the, uh, you know, I don't follow the Lord like I should all the time, but I still pray. Thanks, Mr. Perry. Um, and uh, but it does help. It does help to reach out to somebody like uh, Mr. Perry or anybody that's been in a situation. Just kind of get the to, you know together as groups and just kind of hash it out. Um, we're not beating our chest to say you know we've been through this and and we you know you guys went through this and we went through that because each conflict is different. Um, like again, we had no we had no support. Um, I'm lucky to this day to be sitting here with you gentlemen talking about this and Mr. Perry because they could have easily freaking slaughtered all of us. They have thousands. They had thousands and thousands of people over there, and uh, our aircraft was getting shot out of the sky left and right, and we were losing people left and right, and we had injuries left and right, and everybody was out of the hangar doing their job. Um, we were losing our vehicles, um, and again. Um, I don't know from the top side, um, like from the generals up above, but I will say that uh, General um, 
General Garrison did an outstanding job. He took all this. Every, once the mission was over with and we came back to the United States, I'll say this, General Garrison's a superior leader, and so was uh, Jerry Boykin, superior leader. Um, they took all the brunt and all the all the mistakes from the mission uh, that people say that, that wasn't, it wasn't a su- success. But, you know, what mission is it success? Did we take down the infrastructure? Did we t- capture a deed? Um, did we, uh, you know, did we, um, apply, uh, um, regular, like, um, I wouldn't say principles. Did we, uh, do what we're supposed to to let that country know that we're here to help them? Um, sometimes, you know, the, uh, you know, we bloody the nose over there. We bloodied the country. Did we leave like we should have? Did we establish some, some, uh, mentors or av- or uh, not aviators but um special forces green berets or whoever like uh, advisors that go back in there in that country and then rebuild them rebuild their military establish new governments and stuff did we do that um my job wasn't to do that uh, my job was to go over there and, and get rid of the bad guys yeah so i would you know encourage you nobody ever says this so i'll say it um we can we always say we lost 19 19- and we wounded 73 and we don't count the other side because if we did you guys kill 800 people and wounded probably 4,000 yes sir Adid had to do the math and go if I fight them one more time I don't have a militia in just 18 hours they were at like 30 percent basically 19 men attributed them down to 30 percent that's not a lose. I no. mean, we lost guys, but that's a win. And and he looked at it and went, if I fight U.S. forces and now they're prepared, like like we're not going, they're not going to do this again the second time. It's not going to be this way. Um, he knew that if he fought us even one more time, it was he was done. He he won't have a militia, and that's why it didn't take but six or eight weeks. He was going to peace talks because he had nothing left, and he knew he if he shot, fought one more time, he was done. So I think. You know, you guys got to remember that that's you. You guys did that. And you go up against Task Force Ranger and you lose half your, more than half your militia in, in 18 hours. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, that's like a 44 to 1 kill ratio. Um, that's pretty good mac- combat calculus, you know? Yeah, that is. Uh, it yeah, is. yeah. So, yeah, don't ever feel like it's a lose because it wasn't a lose. It, it, was, it was real. And it was and it was rough, but it was definitely a win. Um, and you can take heart to that. Um, yeah. So I like to talk about the four things: it's friends, family. Um, <laughs> I wrote it down. I forgot it <laughs> as I'm sitting here confused. Um, it's a little emotional today. Um, yeah, faith, family. Yeah, I left faith out. It's silly. Yeah. So faith helps you get there. Helps you through it. Family helps you recover. Friends help you recover, and forgiveness helps you get past it. A couple of things we did that were really great. Um, if I could tell you my old battalion commander, Colonel Cochran, uh, we're friends to this day, and we talk. Usually around this time of year, we get on the phone together, and uh, he was my battalion commander back at Campbell. We were operating under a 10th Mountain Battalion Commander there because we're a task force attached to them. So, um, But Cochran, when we got back, one of our, our crew chief, I mean, our door gunner, Anderson, had a came from Lucas, Iowa, a little town in, in uh, Iowa, and his town made a little memorial for him. Now, this would never happen today, but they let me and Dale Schrader, <laughs> the guys shut down together, and his wife, who was a lieutenant at the time, fly into formation. We, we all, the whole unit went up there to Lucas. We attended a memorial service and we did a missing man formation and we got to fly the missing man part of it. So they put me, Dale, and his wife in the aircraft, which I don't think anybody would sign off on that risk assessment today. Um, But it was great because we got to be the the homesick angel when we flew over the the memorial. And that gave us some closure with the family. We honored our our brother and it was really good for me to, to, to experience that. We all left wings on his, on his headstone and things like that to give to the family, to give to him. And it gave us some closure. Um, that was pretty helpful. And so 
the way that the unit welcomed us, the way that the unit helped us. I will say, though, um, the Army was failing dramatically when it comes to family. We got a lot of True. counseling. Definitely. But my sons, who are the little guys, and my wife, we, didn't, we weren't thinking about the families. And so they had a lot of things that they had to deal with um, that didn't really get... I don't think that's the way it is now. But back then, we were kind of learning how to do combat. We hadn't been in combat. You know, walk around, you never see a, left, a right shoulder patch on anybody. All of a sudden, right shoulder patches are starting to appear, but we don't know how to deal with what we're doing. Right. So I, I think one of the uh, you know the great analogies I've heard uh, you know in recent time came from uh, you know an Indigenous Approach podcast with Jeff Strucker and Colonel uh, Colonel Dickey, the First Special Forces Command Chaplain, and you know they analyze this as as an analogy of a long walk so you know preparing for combat it really gets you in a different mindset and where you are at the beginning of that march uh to where you are after and then well after the fact after it's passed and you've had time to process it it really can be like a really long dirty ruck march where you know you've got a long way to go and a heavy rucksack to carry and you're going to change and you're going to experience things on that path. And and those, those things that we go through on that journey are, are what shapes us as, uh, you know, and our resiliency and our leadership styles uh, and how we bring that back to, you know, our formations, our communities, our families, um, you know, just just collectively as, as a group. And I, th- I thought that was a really you know, great analogy. So in it. Anytime you go through, a, you know, a traumatic event or a combat event, and I expect that most people that, you know, are joining us in on this podcast would probably, you know, have a significant, or have at least a background in, in combat experiences or uh, or going to be a, a leader tomorrow and might have a formation that's facing the same uh, type of ordeal. I, I just think that, you know, the long walk analogy is just, just spot on. You're going to go through your things and your preparation and your training uh, that are going to shape you. Uh, you're going to experience things while you're uh, executing your mission sets, uh, whether that's in a collective training environment or that's operationally, you know, downrange. Uh, but there's a couple of things that always come back in how we still being able to focus on the mission and then how we progress, uh, you know, through the tra- through traumatic events, you know, should they happen. And those always seem to come back to, uh, you know, Perry, your your four, your four high points are are spot on: friends, family, faith, forgiveness. Definitely, those always are at the forefront. And then, you know, just like we said, in the, you like you said in the beginning, um, the thing that really comes back together is, you know, the muscle memory and the training and the faith that we put in our brothers in arms that are on the left and right of us, uh, that are in our formation. And, you know, that's the the gluing bond of our profession of arms. So Adam, I'm going to pass it over to you. Uh, can you take us through the options that we have for uh, dealing with these traumatic events and when we're facing a traumatic event from combat or whether that's an event that we've experienced here at home? Uh, you know, how do we deal with the loss, the grief, and the recovery of these long walk type uh, scenario events? Okay, absolutely, Mike. Thanks for having me here today, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, we have several options available for service members and their beneficiaries. Our primary sources of support are our um, multidisciplinary behavior health department here at Lister Army Health Clinic. Uh, at Lister, we have social workers, psychologists, psychiatric prescribers, substance use disorder clinical care, and family ac- advocacy program. Uh, we accept referrals from command, primary care, unit medical providers, and self-referrals. Um, we were required to document the medical record at the, at the clinic. Um, however, the chaplains and the military family life counselors don't have that re- don't have that requirement. Um, our unit installation chaplains and spiritual life centers are absolutely great resource. I'm glad you're bringing faith into the, uh, the topic. Um, they're available and they have it on call 24/7 um, um, for the soldiers and families in need. Um, another resource is the family military the, fa- the military family life counselors. That's our MFLEX. Uh, we have seven on post. Um, and actually, yeah, there's actually one specifically um, for for families and children. So um, that's something that, you know, there seems to be a void of before. Um, 
in addition to our services on post, there are many other agencies available. One of those agencies is the Military One Source. Um, I think most far folks uh, know that it's out there. I've heard it at some point in their career, but um, it can be uh, underutilized. So it's a it's an easy way. To, it's a stepping off point. Um, it's it, and they're available to refer soldiers off post. Which soldiers yeah, and I think it's good to like. I know I'm glad you mentioned the MFLAX because I don't think soldiers know that when they see an MFLAX, that that remains private. Absolutely, and that's the that's the advantage that they have. Um, and uh, the MFLAC can even, um, you know, they're able to make appointments after after duty hours. You know, plan ahead. Um, so it's a it's a good place to start. Um, definitely. And we've come a long ways too. Like back in the day, if you had problems, issues, or anything like that, psychological or mental or something like that, you're pretty much in the Rangers. Pack your bags. You're a Ranger. You know, your job is to you know seek kill and destroy i mean that's how we were that's how we were driven as soldiers back then um you know the ranger creed and stuff like that but again there's so many things that we evolved around and we've we've uh you know we've added on with all the conflict we've been in for 20 plus years mm -hmm. we've learned from our mistakes that's what we learn we'll learn from this these 20 years and then we'll just add on yeah i was talking to a colleague just yesterday you know um when we started out in oif1 we had division mental health we had like two providers for the entire 101st. Um, you know, there was the other, you know, area support, core support, but um, or organic. We were very limited. So um, we, we're, we're lucky to have the resources we have now. Absolutely. And that's part of that holistic health approach that we have uh, to taking care of our formation and make sure that the wellness and readiness are nested and, and interlocking efforts today. So if I could just throw, you know, one more thing in there. We, we never want to forget. That's what we, that's why we're even doing this so that we remember those that we've left, that have, have left us and those that have fallen in combat. And I think they're really healthy ways that we can honor them and, and, and remember. Um, and I think we need to seek out the healthy ways. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not against having a drink from my brothers in arms. I'm going to probably do it on the 25th, you know, um, and so I want to toast them, but I got to be careful not to fall into the, into the, 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 the area the where, I, where, I, <laughs> where I, I go down a dark hole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I want to honor them with my life too. One of the things that my wife and I talked about was, well, they're saying you can leave the army if you want. And my thing was, well, if I don't fly again, if I don't fight again, then they won but I'm going to honor my brothers by getting back in that aircraft and go and continuing to, to be a soldier. So lots of ways we can honor in, in healthy ways. So we should encourage guys to seek out those healthy ways. Yeah, that is a, that is a key point. That's a, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to highlight on too is, you know, you know, honoring our fellow fallen comrades and fellow brothers in arms. That's, you know, that's an essential part of, you know, dealing with those checkpoints on that long walk uh, event from a uh, traumatic combat experience. And you, you know, that's part of the grieving process. It's part of the, you know, the faith and forgiveness part of it. It's part of the memorializing and, you know, commemorating our brothers in arms. I, I know, again, that's it's really it goes back to that bonding glue of our professional arms is is honoring those that we serve on our left and right with now i'll pose this question to the group you know what do you, as a you know as a collective what do you guys want to share with the audience today as a takeaway uh, when they're walking that long path from grief to resiliency like for soldiers that have either been through soldiers or operators that have been through a, uh, you know, traumatic combat experience or uh, tomorrow's leaders that are preparing uh, for the future that they may face. I can go ahead. Um, I'd like to encourage our service members to reach out and, you know, not suffer in silence. Um, we often see soldiers late in their career. Um, they've bottled up their emotions and not having the opportunity to process their experiences. Uh, it can be detrimental uh, waiting, waiting too long. 
early intervention and active participation in services, they, they, they do have the best outcomes, and there's a, there's a multitude of resources available. Um, and, you know, solitude and moderation, it, it can be therapeutic, but, you know, isolation and limited and no social supports can be, can be dangerous and is a primary risk factor for, for suicide. Um, I recommend, you know, seeking out healthy, positive connections with others that you can confide in and just support each other. You know, although it's improved, you know, we continue to, to struggle with stigma and seeking out services. Uh, peer support can be extremely beneficial, and it's a, it's a good stepping off point for those getting the care they need. Just knowing that they're not alone out there and have similar stories, it can make a big difference. And I just can't really say enough about peer support. It's a, it's a big part of the recovery process. Um, you know, if there's, if there's those that are apprehensive to share their story and challenges, you know, there's anonymous hotlines, uh, there's confidential resources that they can take, take advantages, to, advantages of just to take that first step. Perry and Jeff, any, any thoughts? Probably the having commanders that, that, are, that are tough and hard but also show strong integrity um, can go a very long way in helping soldiers to, to deal with the aftermath of these things. Um, so I, I think I had some of the best leaders that ever served in the army and I know a lot of guys say the same thing um, but my commanders and my my, uh, my company commander uh, Jane O'Connor um, was was fantastic in, in support and and just helping us to 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 talk about what we need to talk about and deal what we need to deal with um, so I think having some strong integrity but also encouraging their soldiers to seek help to get together and discuss how they're feeling. Um, I used to joke about feelings and go, I don't, I hate feelings. Don't talk. I don't talk about feelings. That's just stupid. But I, you know, I'm 60 now and, uh, you stuff them down and hold on to them and don't talk about things that you're feeling and it will come back to hurt you later. And, and some really it comes out in some dramatic ways unexpectedly. So, um, I would tell the commanders what, even though it may not seem like a bad thing when someone goes through a loss or uh, have your combat operations go south, um, there's a lot that can be done when the unit gets back and even while you're there to um, help guys cope with what they're experiencing and by, just simply by by speaking with each other about it and, and trusting that what they say stays where they say it. Yeah. Adam, can you share the program points of contacts that are available to the Fort Rucker community? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I need to point out that September is National Suicide Awareness Month while I'm here. I'm fortunate to have this podcast as a medium to share this information and resources. And thanks again for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, I'm going to share some contacts now. So for our audience, if you'd you know, please uh, write this down if you're able to. Uh, you can reach us at the Multidisciplinary Behavioral Health Clinic at Lister Army Health Clinic. Um, our number there is 334-255-7028. The Installation Religious Support Office is available at 334-255-2989. Uh, they can put you in touch with that on-call duty chaplain 24-7 and unit POCs, as I mentioned. And the, the Military Family Life Counselors um, that are on post, um, their main number is 334 334- Seven nine six nine nine four six. I'll have all the mentioned program POCs and more available for our audience in the comments. Thank you. The thing we can take away from today is, as, as operators, as aviators, uh, as future leaders of tomorrow, as leaders of today, uh, preparation for the job that we do in the professional arms in the Army uh, and across the uh, DOD requires dedicated leadership. It requires uh, trust in the brother and sister on the left and right of you. It requires that we have a holistic approach to the things we're doing, whether that's training, whether that's readiness, uh, and taking care of our formation, our family, our faith, our wellness, our, our overall collective organization as a whole. Um, and these experiences that we go and face, they truly are a long walk, and they they will change you along the way, and and it's and it's okay, and that's expected uh, for that. But we have really came a long way, and there are absolutely 
uh, things that can help us deal with this and prepare with it. And, you know, one of the most important things that we can do uh, going forward, in addition to applying all the tools that are available for us as, uh, as, as members of the military, uh, past, present, future, with the tools at hand, is applying those. But we can also spend some time and revisit those lessons learned that are that are hard. You know, combat is is hard, and taking time to understand those lessons learned. So, in, in conclusion, I'd like to say a special thanks today to CW three retired Mr. Perry Allen and then Sergeant First Class retired Mr. Jeff Holtz. Thank you for joining us today and sharing, taking the time to share your experiences. It's always been a pleasure to talk with you, and we look forward to speaking with you every opportunity that we get. Major Adam Keller, thanks again to you, and a special thanks to the Lister Army Health Clinic team uh, for joining us in this podcast today as we've shared these resources and availability uh, of of them to our team uh, as we go forward and face these long walks. And then on behalf of the USACE Command Team and the Special Operations Center of Excellence, thank you for joining us on this special edition of the podcast. Above the best.